you have a Bible this morning, and you'll read along with us in our scripture lesson, we're going to take a very brief reading today from the book of Romans, chapter 5. The book of Romans, chapter 5. And this text, many of you may even have memorized, um, especially the verse 20 of our uh, scripture reading. I don't recall ever having preached on this text, though I've referenced it, I'm sure, many times. And I'm sure you've heard it preached on as well. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 20 and reading to verse 21. It says this, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And that'll conclude our reading this morning. It's Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. And our thought will come from verse 20. And the title of our message today is Abounding Grace. Abounding Grace. I've often thought about um, things that are unknown to us right now. Think, for example, if one of us in here has an illness. We just don't know about it yet. It's there. It may even be a fatal one. But we have no idea it's there. I was thinking about the Wheat family. Night after night, they slept in their house. Things were fine. A storm came after storm came, and they never knew that those storms and that weather was just slowly leading to a day where their house would collapse. Had they known, they would have made provisions. But they didn't know. Only God knows those things. And so, oftentimes what we need is an instrument of sorts or a change of perspective of sorts. Say, for example, you start feeling symptoms of something physically being wrong. You're going to go into a doctor and you're going to ask that doctor, will you look me over? And if he can, by his own discernible expert eye, find the cause of your problems, then he's probably going to use some technology that's been invented in the last number of years to be able to see past what the visible eye can see. And so he might order a CAT scan or a PET scan or an X-ray or any number of things that he might discern what the underlying issue is. Because you see, in a situation like that, there are really two problems. One is the problem itself, but the greater problem is your ignorance to what that problem is. And so to adequately address the core problem, you've got to fix the problem of your and my lack of knowledge. Now, in one sense, going into a doctor under those circumstances is a very split feeling. We had a friend here recently, some of you may know them at least online, who had their daughter started showing symptoms, started losing weight very rapidly. And so they went to the doctor and they ran test after test after test. And her health continued to decline. And every test came back negative. There was nothing wrong. And so on one hand, they're holding their breath, hoping that the tests come back negative because they don't want their daughter to be diagnosed with some of the more significant issues like leukemia and other things that worried them. But on the other hand, that negative test just compounded the problem because it did not allow them to know what to do to address the underlying issue. Now, thankfully, this week, she's seen some improvement, and yet, st still strange. They still don't know what was wrong and what she was struggling with. It's a very torn feeling. 
Because on the one hand, the knowledge is needed, but on the other hand, the way that that knowledge will make you feel when you have the knowledge of what is wrong can be heartbreaking. See, I think today many people avoid anything about religion and they don't realize it's for the same reason, right? Is that they know inherently God has made it self-evident to all of us and Romans chapter 2 tells us that tucked down in our conscience, God has written a moral law which testifies to us and makes accusations against us when we have broken the laws of God. And so you don't have to darken the doors of a a church. You don't have to listen to a preacher. But rather, God tells us that in the intricate design of human beings, he has put inside of you a preacher, one that proclaims to you when you have sinned and what you have done wrong. And the Bible calls that the moral law. You and I know when we have done wrong because our conscience testifies of it. So then why go to church at all? Why do we need to darken the doors? Why does the Bible tell tell us in the book of Hebrews that we don't need to forsake the assembling of ourselves together? Well, simply because what Timothy tells us is that our conscience can become hardened. Or in other words, when we hear that message coming from our heart over and over again, We can dull that voice, we can harden ourselves to the convicting power of that voice and continuously ignore it. No different than when you learn to play the guitar and as you put your fingers upon the frets for the first time, it hurts. And you do it 10 times and the calluses that you build no longer cause those frets to hurt. That is how often the moral law becomes, is that whenever we commit sin and we do wrong, our conscience preaches that it's wrong, but we have this innate ability to suppress the voices of our conscience and actually convince us ourselves of the very opposite. And that is that we're not wrong in what we did, but rather that we're justified in doing the wrong. Human heart's a wicked thing. It's amazingly complex and able to convince us of even the most absurd things. We don't have to look very far to see that, right? The Bible tells us at the end of the book of, or excuse me, the first chapter of the book of Romans that people will come to the place where they look at evil as good and good as evil. And if you've not had your eyes open here recently, that is the continuum that we're sliding down in our current culture is that we're beginning to label people who are preaching right and standing for the standards of God as bigots and hateful and sinful. And the people that are proudly proclaiming sin, we're anointing them as angelic of a sorts. What we need, what every person needs, is for God to speak truth to our hearts. Verse 20 in our scripture text tells us of this form of grace that does not feel when it comes like grace. The Bible says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Or in other words, from the time of Adam until the time of Moses, the book of Romans chapter 3 tells us that there was many people that lived and they committed great many sins, but those sins were not similar to the one that Adam committed. It was different. And yet from the time of Adam to Moses, there was no law that had been given. When we think of Moses, we obviously, the Bible tells us in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 17, that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And so we know, and and the stories have been told in Sunday school endlessly, of Moses bringing down those two uh, big stones with ten commandments upon them. And then we read, if we go through Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and the rest of Exodus, all 613 laws that Moses gave to Israel. And so Moses has become this symbol of the law. And yet what we find is that before the time of Moses, there were a great many people that lived and sinned and died. And so we ask the question, how is it that those people sinned if they didn't have the law? 
Or in other words, how could I hold somebody accountable for something if I didn't tell them not to do it in the first place? I don't hold my children to that standard. I don't think it's a fair standard to hold children to. And yet the Bible tells us it's because God made the law evident in our hearts. And yet, over time, that law became buried. And it became difficult for people to perceive it. And so God extended grace to mankind and said, rather than having to trust your conscience or the stories of other people or the teachings of other people, I, as God, am going to set down and give you an unwavering standard called the law. Think of it like this. If, you know, I uh, move into this new house, haven't done it yet, but I know I will, get pictures to hang on the wall. You get a picture... Have somebody hold it, and you get a level. And to the discernible eye, it looks perfectly straight. And then you realize, well, the wall is not level. I remember the first time that I ever had somebody tell me that. I was at my aunt's house. I was about 17. And she said, well, the wall is not level. That's impossible. (laughs) I didn't know anything about building. What do you mean the wall is not level? But it wasn't. And so then she had to find a way to make the picture slant like the wall. Right? That was fun. The law that God gave was meant to be a standard. Something that even if you put yourself against the backdrop of civilization and you look at all the other people and all the other people tell you you're holy, you're good, you're just, you're a good person, and people do that to one another. People laud one another with praise, building each other up, because often what it's a way of doing is by me building you up, I recognize that I have qualities similar to you, and so by justifying you, I can also justify myself. You see, God saw mankind standardless except for the standard that he had wrote on their heart. And so God, by his grace, gave this law to mankind. And the purpose of the law, what Romans chapter 5, verse 20 tells us, is that the purpose of it was so that the offense might abound. It's the opposite of what human nature tells us to do because normally what we're told to do is when we're given a standard, most people's compulsion is to be deemed righteous, I must keep everything in the law. But the Bible tells us that when God gave the law to Moses, the fundamental purpose was not to justify mankind for the Bible says this, that if a law could have been given which would have brought righteousness, then righteousness would have been by the law. But in other words, if God could could have created rules and you could have kept them for salvation, he would have done it. But mankind is so plunged into sin that there is not a rule that God could give that mankind would not break. What better example than the most simple law that God gave to that perfect man and woman, Adam and Eve in the garden? How many times have I thought of the silliness of that law? A law that I give my three-year-old was the law that God gave to Adam and Eve in that perfect state. Don't touch it. That's it. Don't touch it. And if you do, here's the consequence. God gave a simple law. Adam and Eve were an exalted state to what you and I are, and yet still righteousness was not able to even be preserved through the law. See, the law was never meant to be given for people to earn salvation. Listen, you're a kid. You might be like I was as a kid. I was a rule keeper. I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to obey my teachers. I wanted to obey my parents. I wanted to go to the path of least resistance. And there was this subconscious part of me that told me, if I'm a good kid and I'm a good person, certainly when God looks at me, I know what I hear preached from the pulpit. I know what my parents have taught me. I know that I need to be saved. But certainly there will be a lighter judgment upon me if I kept the law better than other people did. And that's the attitude that so many people have today. I think they use in their back pocket a just in case my salvation's not good enough, I'll live right so when I stand before God, he'll go easy on me in the judgment. Listen, that's not the purpose of God's law. 
God's law is not meant to pat you on the back and say, you kept this one. Good job today. You haven't broken many rules. You can go to bed and I'm going to bless you in the morning. That is not the purpose of God's law, but rather God's law was given to magnify how awful our sinful nature really is. You are bad. You are sinful. And so am I. And our culture does everything they can to lessen the impact of that. And when people, I've seen so many times, when people who are not of a religious background and these children get to the age of accountability and they start feeling the guilt of their sins, everyone around them comes around and tells them. And the first thing they often say when they start feeling low in their self-esteem and guilty for sin, they say, well, you're a really good kid. And look at all these wonderful things that you have done. And I think you're giving them the opposite of what God says is exactly what they need. I don't want a doctor, if my children, or if I'm diagnosed with cancer, I don't want a doctor coming in and saying, you're going to be just fine. Just take some vitamins, take some minerals, eat your fruits and veggies, and you're going to be good. He may at the moment make me feel okay. But the reality is, That man loves himself and hates me. He loves himself because he doesn't want to be the bearer of bad news. And you know, we have a world today of preachers, of religious figures, of pundits on TV, of psychologists and psychiatrists and counselors at schools all over the place. And what they're afraid to do is speak truth to people. And because they're afraid to speak truth to people, people live their life in this distorted understanding of the world. And yet what they feel and sense within is that their heart and their mind and that sin continuously, increasingly becomes this rowdy taskmaster that controls them. And it breaks my heart when sometimes people are reaching out and desiring truth and they come to a place that is supposed to be like the doctor to give them healing and yet they come and they really get a a medicine that is going to worsen their case. What people need today is truth with love. When you're talking about your children or your grandchildren, or your neighbor. We have this tendency in our culture, we have this commandment. It's the golden commandment of the American culture. And here's what it is. You ready? Be nice. Be nice. Don't ever break that commandment in the American culture. Because if you do, you'll be called every name in the book. Hateful, judgmental, holier than thou, racist, xenophobic, you'll be called everything. And the merits of what you are saying are completely ignored because you broke the one commandment. Be nice. Reality teaches us this. If you're just going to be a competent adult in the world, you've got to learn how to handle hard news. Feedback about your job. Feedback, constructive, sometimes hurtful responses about your behavior, about your words, about your parenting. And yet all those things are necessary. That's just for this life. How much more the life to come? You see, the Bible tells us here, the law was given that sin could be made clear. That's why it was given. It's the level. It's the CAT scan. It's the microscope that is able to look past uh, what man's eyes can see because God sees beyond those things into the heart. And God speaks. And when he speaks, he speaks beyond what is readily observable to us. And the law was given in order for us to better see our sin. And so when we glance at the law of God, and that's what the next thing, it says this. For where sin abounded. So you look at the law of God, and we set this standard up on the wall, and we look at it. And we could do a great number of things to that. We could just take me, and I could set out that law for you, 
and I could say, I want you to judge me according to God's standard. You can ask me any question you want. You can dig in my life in any way you want. And let's say that I was willing to be completely transparent to you. And you used a microscopic view on my life or on any person's life. What you're going to find is that sin stains it all. Your will, the things that you want, are stained with sin. Your mind and the things that you can conceive of is stained with sin. Your affections, what you like. You know those things that you like that you don't talk about? The things you love? Stained with sin. Your memory embellishes, doesn't it? Right? There's always that fisherman's joke. The fish wasn't that big. It was that big. Right? And obviously it's a it's kind of a joke, but it's also kind of a indicative of our fallen human memory. When we repeat stories that are trying to express something that was great or wonderful, does it not fall within the, tempter, the temptation of our hearts always to exaggerate and use hyperbole so we can describe and impress the person that we're speaking to? All of that is an, a, a pattern or a stain that is revealed of our sin as human beings. Every aspect of the human person is stained with sin. Or we could just take the panoramic view. You know, that's the view I always prefer. I feel like oftentimes people will sometimes get caught up in the little details. And I like taking a step back and looking at kind of the big picture. Sometimes I get lost in the big picture because I do that too often. I don't observe the details closely enough. But let's take the panoramic view. Let's step back from observing just a person and let's observe the world in general. And if we look around the world, we don't see good taking place, do we? If I was to ask every person in this room, when you look ahead in America 30 years from now, do you see hope or are you fearful? I'll bet you every person in this room that's got any sense would say, I'm a little fearful. Why? Because sin abounds everywhere. This month alone and what it is celebrated to be is great evidence enough of the sinful drift of our culture. Pride Month, if you don't know. It's a celebration of homosexuality and the relationships that people have like that. And anywhere you turn, this is the first year I've noticed it to the same degree. Every store I walk into, commercials, movies, even my children harmlessly watching a show in the commercials that cut between, they try to celebrate something that God completely condemns thoroughly throughout his whole world, uh, throughout his whole word as sin. And yet, it's celebrated and it is getting to the place that not only if you don't agree with it are you condemned, if you don't celebrate it, you are condemned. Our culture is drifting in a bad place. Say, Brother Brad, this is just our culture. We can look around the cultures of the world. Americans, unfortunately, are very blind to what goes on in the world. But if we were to open ourselves up and avail us of, of what goes on in other nations, what we would find is that the corruption we find in our own governments, the corruption and the, the sinfulness that we find amongst our own leaders and in our own culture is often pale in what you find in other countries around the world. Right? I've often thought for people who so readily condemn America in so many of the places that they lift up as examples of good, I would say, I'll buy you a one-way ticket there and see how long that you stay. Because what you'll find very quickly is that America, despite all of our sin, is still a wonderful place to be. And yet that alone is very scary for the intolerance that is on the horizon. We take the panoramic view and we find that over the last number of centuries, the last 
basically two centuries, we lived in this small blip of time where for the most part, mankind has experienced peace and comparative harmony and humanity. And it's indescribable what we have experienced, what we have been blessed to know versus what the people of the history of the world have known. And you don't have to be a history student very long to be appalled at how degradated human nature truly is when it's exposed. And we take the panoramic view and we see sin is awful. And so then what people begin to do is they begin to be doomsdayers. People begin, especially in our circles, they begin to fall into a depression and a discouragement because they look and they say it's bad right now and it seems as though it's getting worse. And they take our situation, they compare it to Rome, and they compare it to Greece, and they compare it to Persia, and they compare it to Great Britain, and they compare it to empires past, and they say, we're on that same trajectory downhill. And they get to be doomsdayers and depressed and discouraged, and it gives us the temptation to just throw up our hands and say, well, at least I'm going to heaven, I'm ready to go, forget everyone else, I'll enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, and just whatever happens I'll trust God because I'm going to heaven. And yet, to me, this scripture gives us so much hope not to do that. The law entered to tell us we're all sinful. And sin reigns in this world. And the king, the prince and the power of the air, does, yes, have great power. And his reign and his domination is noticeable everywhere you turn. And yeah, this is one of the many redeeming phrases, in my opinion, of the King James Version of the Bible because it's such a beautiful, short statement of profound truth that a person ought to memorize and remember in times of discouragement. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Listen, this isn't Paul's opinion This isn't Brother Hicks trying to preach a health, wealth, and prosperity. Everything's going to be good in the end gospel, right? Because you can go and pay people to do that. And it's easy to find every preacher on the street that will tell you only good news. And yet, we cannot be lost in Satan's trick in trying to also convince us of the opposite extreme. Not that everything is great, but that nothing is going to be okay that we're doomed and that we must despair of our lives and of the hope and the future of our loved ones because it's all going to be flushed down the toilet and then things are awful. Rather, what the Bible tells us is, yes, what you observe is much sin and sometimes it runs rampant and sometimes it appears as though that the prince of the power of the air, that he roams about and that he has a scepter sitting upon his throne conducting the affairs of man. And yet the Bible tells us this, where sin abounded, Grace did much more abound. Friends, we have the throne of grace in heaven where God sits and his power has never been diminished and he still has the same power to reach upon this earth and to affect the heart of men as much as he ever has. And I'll even go as far to say he has the willingness to do so. God's grace abounds much more than sin abounds. And that is what gives us hope to keep going on. Do you have a loved one who's been out of church, who has given up and cursed the ways of God, who hates old union church, has uttered the words, I'll never be back. Grace does much more abound. You got lost loved ones getting up in years. We were at Fairview Memorial on Wednesday night. 70-year-old man, I don't know how old he was. Still seeking the Lord. No doubt feeling discouraged. No doubt thinking about his time that he has left. And I just wanted to shake him and say, grace does much more abound. All of your hopelessness, all the feelings that you might feel that arise up in your body, there is hope and it's real and it can be tangible at the foot of grace. Oh, the story. You know, I think today, We struggle with it because we see so few stories of extraordinary grace. That's why we struggle with it today, right? If we saw extraordinary pictures of grace, it would change us. That's what Paul told us in the book of Timothy, right? 
Do you remember Paul's testimony as he's writing to Timothy, one of the first books that he's ever written in the very first chapter? I want you to listen to this hope that Paul the apostle, he believes that part of the reason God called him to be an apostle, part of the reason why God saved him was not just because of the gifts that he had, the natural talents that he had, but it was more than that. It was because he was a horrible, despicable sinner and that God wanted to make an example of how great the grace of Christ was in saving him. Listen to this text. It says this, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. We've already spoke about this this morning. But for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers, of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, of men stealers, of liars, perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. I'm going to stop there for just a moment. I heard this week of a, a, a couple coming into the church that were homosexual just in one of our churches that was having a revival up where I come from, and they came in, and one of the, one of the deacons called me, and he was all concerned and rattled by what took place because they came in, and they were sitting there listening, and he said, what did we what should we have done? I said, what do you mean what should you have done? Where else would you want them to be? Paul is saying the law and the gospel was given for sinful people, not righteous people. God doesn't want his churches full of suits and ties and dresses. God wants his churches full of broken people, sinful people, people who are liars, people who are swindlers and cheaters, homosexuals, racists. This is the place for those people to be because that's what the gospel and the law was given for. Why? Because when a person comes under the influence of the Spirit, yielding the powerful law of God, the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ, and it begins to break their heart, it reveals a necessary truth that all people need to hear, and that is you are a sinner in need of a Savior. And very often, it's we righteous people. I say we righteous people. We churchified people. We rocked in the Baptist cradle from beginning to end that that subconsciously think better of ourselves because of our own sinful nature. We oftentimes think of church as this stiff place where things have to happen. But it's not. I would love, mark my words today, I would love for a homosexual couple to come into this church and sit down and for me to begin to preach, and for one of them to raise their hand and say, I have a question. I have a question I'd like to ask you. It's just that I love this person. Why does God hate me for the way that I was born? We might shudder. We might get all nervous and anxious and sweaty-palmed. We shouldn't. You know, we should all think, I'm so glad they're here. I'm so glad they're here. Because it's only by going to the doctor and having that scan that the power of it can compel them to seek to fix it. You ever notice you go to two different doctors, two different experts, one to get diagnosed and one to have the treatment? That's how it is in the house of God. You come to the church of God to get the diagnosis. You go to Christ himself to get the healing. Paul says the law was given for all these types of people. But listen to him. He continues and says this. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before, this is what Paul did before this. Before he wrote the Bible, he says this. I was a blasphemer. Think about that. You know what a blasphemer does? Use God's name in vain. You ever watch a movie? They say cuss words. You know, there are some cuss words where one of them slips out of a character's mouth, and I'll say, okay, I'll pass that by. As long as it doesn't get worse than that, I'm going to, it's just one cuss word. But you know, there there, there's some will never be in my household, and that's if you blaspheme the name of the Lord. I don't care how well reported the movie is. I don't care if it wins all the Golden Globes. I don't care how many church people tell me I need to watch it. If you're holding God's name in vain, I will never watch that movie. Never be, it shouldn't be in your house either. He says, not only, he wasn't just an observer of it. He was a participant of it. He blasphemed God's name. Imagine all the horrible things that Paul said about Jesus Christ before he got saved. 
Imagine there as he was standing observing the stoning of Stephen, all the horrible things that he was deriding Stephen about. Paul says, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. Today in our culture, we're at the blaspheming part. That's where we're at. It would not surprise me at all if someday in the not so distant future there were pride rallies held at our church outside to disrupt us. That wouldn't surprise me. It goes on in other places in our culture, in our country, where people try to deride and cause a disturbance. But they stop right now at blaspheming. Paul didn't stop there. He took it a step further for people who were followers of Christ. He hurt them. He persecuted them. He killed them. He put them into prison. And he sought legal rights to do it. What do you think the ACLU is doing in our country today? Other than seeking legal rights to oppress people who have genuine religious conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord and that the Holy Bible is the truth, the real standard of God. That's exactly what they're doing. All in the name of freedom. Here Paul says, I was a blasphemer. I was in those pride rallies. I was like those that are reported of over in the Middle East that capture men and put them into prison and murder those people. Stories that at this moment seem a long way off. Paul says, I was that. And he says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. You know, those people in our culture that do that, they're not our enemies. You realize that? I was in Salt Lake City one time for work. And when I was walking to the place I had to work, there was a big rally being held right by the Mormon, uh, the Mormon temple. Purposeful, right? Blatant, provocative is what the attempt was to be. They were being loud and yelling and trying to hand out memorabilia. Oftentimes, God's people can be... It, it should... The action should detest us, but the people should not. They're not our enemies. Why? Because so many of them do it just like Paul did. Ignorantly and in unbelief. And, God's, and Paul says this, I obtained mercy of God because I did it ignorantly. In other words, this, God looked down from heaven. He saw that Paul had been trained and is indoctrinated to be that way. So God had mercy upon him. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. Isn't that wonderful? The blasphemer, the persecutor, the injurious man, he's ignorantly going about serving self, serving Satan, serving these causes he doesn't understand anything about, ignorantly and in unbelief. And then God, rich in mercy with his exceeding great grace, reaches down, and this is what it says, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it, for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Oh, what rich scriptures here. Paul is saying, I was selected by God for this to take place so that I could be a pattern to all people who come afterward that there is not a man too far gone into sin that God cannot rescue and save with his abundant, abounding grace. You have people in your life, you know of acquaintances, you know of family that seem well beyond the pale of grace. And Paul says, no, they're not. Look at me as a pattern. God can save them. And friend, what we need today as a church is to become burdened that God would burden us as a group for those people who are a long way off that he might use them as a part of a ministry of this church to save them, bring them as a part of us so that from 
this point forward, it can be an example to the believer of the transformative grace of Jesus Christ that we might have hope when we look at other sinners, that we can pray with more fervency, that we can evangelize with more expectation, and that we can show forth to the world somebody who you think you are deep in sin, but look at this person among us that was the same way that God rescued from sin. He can do the same for you. We need that today. We don't just need our children. We need our children and grandchildren to be saved, but that's not all. And yet for those people to be saved, we have to have courage to go out to them. We have to have faith in a powerful God whose grace abounds more than sin abounds. If we believe, please hear me this morning, if we think that sin abounds more than grace, we will be discouraged, we will give up, we will not be evangelistic because we will have thought that the war has already been lost and there is no hope. But a person who down deep in their soul believes in the word of God that grace abounds more than sin will find the hope and the faith to evangelize and to reach out to those people who are in greatest need of a savior. Think of the people that you know. Think of the people that you intermingle against or with. Why don't you set them as a target of your prayer life? Find the most extreme case you can find and set them as a target. And every day with your heart, pray for them. Diligently pray for them. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the most profound Sinners are the most godly, saved people that exist. I have a friend. Many of you know him, Brother Phil Mayle. Anybody that's close to him knows May 6, 2001 is when God saved him. He's written it into songs. May 6, 2001 is when God saved him. Why? Why does he walk around crying all the time? Why does he walk around a little off? Seemingly to the average person. Why? Why? Because he thinks about his life beforehand. Drinking packs of beer every night. Always inebriated. Always inebriated. From the time he woke up in the morning, proud. And then May 6, 2001, God got a hold of him. And he fell upon his knees. And he found him. And God transformed him. And now all he wants to do is go to the truck stops, to the prostitutes, to the drug addicts, to the homeless shelters, and tell people, God can save you. This morning, I'm so happy, I'm so glad that I can preach in abounding grace. I'm glad it's not a just squeak by. You know? Like, the bill was $100, and I have 102 in my account, and I barely squeaked by. No, it's more like the bill was $100, and I'm Bill Gates. Right? I won't even notice it. I won't even pay that. I'll, I'll pay it a million times more than that and still not even notice the cost that sin had. This morning, God's grace abounds through Jesus Christ. And if you don't know him, you need to come to know the abounding grace of Christ. And you can know him. And if the law of God and if the truth of God is convicting your heart this morning and is showing you your need for a Savior, today is the day you need to seek him. Sister Ashley, if you could get for us a song. God's grace abounds and it's offered free of charge. For the man or the woman that comes and surrenders all at the foot of the cross. Because what they find flowing through Jesus Christ is not just the blood and the water that came from him, but is an abundant fountain of grace that pours down over people. And he'll do that for you this morning. Let's all stand and sing today. If you need to seek the Lord, this altar is very open, very open for you to come and to seek him.